Unto the Hills by Margaret Walker Friel. Chapter 13 It was easy for Margaret and William to settle into a regular routine. Billy was in the store from dawn to dusk, and Margaret at home, occupied every waking hour with milking, cleaning, cooking, and all the endless chores required of pioneer women. That first morning after Billy had gone to work, she paused a few moments to plan her garden of boxwoods, ivy, and roses. She pictured the walks of flat rocks from the creek. However, the practical Margaret soon returned to replace the artistic Margaret, who had been dreaming of flower gardens and garden walks to the mundane thoughts of rows of beans, peas, corn, and squash. Goodness, said Margaret to herself as she became aware of the passage of time. I had planned to go home this morning. She ran into the house and snatched her bonnet, an Indian basket, from the pegs on the wall and hurried down the road. Mother had told her to come and pick some turnip greens, and Margaret wanted to get them in time for dinner. She planned the meal as she walked along toward home. Anybody home, she called as she entered the front door. Cries of delight answered her call. Margaret, who had been gone for only 24 hours, was welcomed home as one returning from a long pilgrimage. When she at last was able to detach herself, she went to the garden to pick the greens, accompanied by little Laura. Laura was so glad to have Margaret back, even for such a short visit. It wasn't long before Margaret was back in her own little house, with the greens merrily boiling in the pot, potatoes buried in the ashes and hoe cake in the iron oven. While dinner was cooking, Margaret cleaned the house, made two new brooms out of broom sedge which was growing near the road, and then carefully scoured the floor. She even had time to prepare some apples for drying in the sun. Billy came in to dinner and soon returned to the store. Margaret once again returned to her work. When dusk came and Billy returned home for the night, both young people were tired but pleased with their day's accomplishments. The days began to blend one into the next. Margaret's stock of provisions for the winter was growing with each passing day. She had dried apples, pumpkins, leather breeches, and a long string of peppers. Look, Margaret, what I've got here, said Billy as he came to dinner. Thomas Tatham and his boys have been hunting and killed a bear. They were surely kind to remember the newlyweds. How wonderful. It's a whole hindquarter. We can dry that and have meat for weeks. This was an especially appreciated gift since their flock of chickens was still too meager to kill, the hogs too young to kill, and there was only the meat Billy's father had sent home with Billy on his last trip to Wilkes County. This wild meat would tide them over until they had meat of their own. Billy carried the quarter out to the log smokehouse. While they were eating their supper of bear meat stew, Billy said, Abram Collett brought in a batch of shoats from the range. I traded with him for three to fatten. After supper, we'll go out and you can hold the light while I mend the hog pen so we can fatten them up on corn. As they were discussing this, they heard noises from outside. Billy rose to investigate. I guess that's Hugh with the hogs. I'll go see. Anybody home? called Hugh Collett. I got you some meat here. Coming, replied Billy as he went to, to the door. Margaret, bring a light so that we can put the hogs in the pen. Margaret took a piece of burning wood from the huge fireplace, and using this as a torch, she led the way to the pen. Banteringly, Hugh said, Margaret, I brought you a lot of hard work. Margaret quickly retorted, That's all right, Hugh. I don't mind hard work, and we do like meat and lard. I'm tickled to death to get the hogs. There isn't anything better than ham. Unless it's backbone and ribs, added Hugh. Amid much surging and squealing of the hogs, the crate in which they were transported was lifted from the wagon to the ground and placed near the pen. In a short time, the hogs were safely fenced in, ready to be corn-fed and fattened for the late November hog killing. Margaret and Billy invited Hugh to join them for supper, and at the proffer of bear stew, no second invitation had to be forthcoming. 
Gosh almighty, I haven't seen bear meat since last winter, said Hugh, pleased to be having some now. Margaret's torch lighted the way to the house, and soon the three of them were enjoying their supper. This was the first company Margaret had served at her table. Before long, Margaret had other guests. Mrs. Collett and her daughter Elizabeth came over one afternoon, and while the girls knitted warm socks for the winter, Mrs. Collett cut out winter underwear of red woolen material for Billy and a chemise for Margaret. Of course, Margaret was delighted with the kindness and generosity of her neighbors, but she was especially pleased to have company for the long afternoon. Mary Collett provided many pieces of sage advice for the young housekeeper. Elizabeth, only a little younger than Margaret, watched with interest and not a little envy as she silently contemplated the possibility of her own home, which she would have in the not-too-distant future. Before any of the three were ready for it, the afternoon was over, and the visitors had to hurry home to their nightly chores. Sunday came, and Billy suggested that he and Margaret go to the Baptist meeting house at Jamestown. He explained that when this land was the Cherokee Nation, there was only one church in the valley. It was the Baptist Church, which had been founded by Grandsire Whitaker and Gideon Morris in 1834. Its charter members were both white and Indian. Margaret agreed to go with Billy, but suggested that she would take a picnic lunch with them, since it was a good distance from their home to the meeting house. This idea met with Billy's immediate approval, and he went out to hitch the pony while she prepared the food. Chapter 14 Days sped by. No matter how early Margaret started her day's work, night came before she could finish all the planned tasks. Margaret's lifestyle was no different from all the other mountain women of her day. They worked long and hard, and about the only thing that made the winter chores a little lighter than summer were the fewer daylight hours in which to work. On a cold November day, Margaret was busily holing up her cabbages and potatoes before the winter freeze. Billy paused on his way to the store. Margaret, I hate to see you doing all that hard work. Maybe I'll leave the store a little early today so I can help you. Oh no, Colonel wouldn't like that. Anyway, I'm sure used to work and I don't mind. I have to get the cabbages and potatoes out of the warm house or they will spoil. Besides, it gets dark so early now that there wouldn't be time to get this done after you get home. I know, but it still bothers me to see my wife working so hard. Maybe your brother could come up and help. I can't be calling on somebody else to do my work. I'll get it done. Margaret got her hoe from the smokehouse and started the garden area. As usual, in the quiet of the morning, she was planning and chattering to herself. This is a good spot. It's a little lower and I won't have to dig so much. I'll rake back the dead grass and use it to help cover the vegetables. Come to think of it, why couldn't I put the potatoes and cabbages all in one hole? What a bright idea. That'll save a lot of work. She worked hard digging and covering the vegetables, but with the job completed, she was ready with dinner when Billy came home from the store. She excitedly reported her progress to Billy. Guess what? I got the cabbages and potatoes all holed up this morning, and now I'm ready to start making kraut after you go back to work. Billy was proud of his wife's accomplishments though he still fretted about her working so hard. The next major project for the young couple was the digging of the well. There was a small creek nearby from which Margaret had carried water for washing and cooking. However, she had not carried drinking water from the Scott family well. However, she had carried drinking water from the Scott family well. A well of her own would be a great time saver. Skilled well diggers had to be hired. This was an expensive undertaking, as well as an added burden to Margaret's already busy schedule, for not only did the men have to be paid, they had to be fed while they were working. Digging a well from 20 to 25 feet deep in 1844 wasn't done with one scoop of a heavy piece of mechanical equipment. Selecting a site for the well required much thought and planning. Margaret pondered. The most convenient place, of course, would be right at the back door, but if we add a separate cook room, the well would be in the way. Also, a woman throws her dirty dishwater out back, 
and the ground around the well should always be dry and clean. The road runs to the west at the front of the house. We're going to plant the garden on the south side. She walked around the house considering every possibility. What about putting the well in front, but a little towards the north side of the house? Get it far enough away that so we could add to the house in that direction. In fact, how about a little to the northwest corner of the house, just where the road curves? Billy was silent for a while, in deep thought. I believe your idea is good. Those dreams you speak of will come true. Someday you will have a very big house. It'll be just as big as you want or ever dreamed of. We'll add at least 60 feet on the north, then a wing on the back. There'll be a cook room and someday a separate dining room. In my dreams, I see a two-storied house painted white. Margaret, my little girl, you won't always live in a log cabin. Oh, Billy, the house won't make any difference. I love you just as much in our little log cabin as in a big white house. Well, never you mind. Someday I'll have the road changed so we will have a larger front yard. We can have a big yard with box bushes in it. And you can have a big flower garden as big as you wish. And someday we're going to have acres and acres of land. Isn't it a wonderful dream? We'll work and save and save and someday it will all come true. Billy had another dream. He was obliged to Colonel John Wog for letting him come to Valleytown and run his store for him. He accepted the old colonel's miserly and exacting ways, but Billy wasn't content to spend the rest of his life working for someone else. He dreamed of owning his own store and maybe even a sawmill. The next morning, Margaret and Billy were out with their torchlight, measuring off the spot where they wanted their well dug. Billy was pleased with Margaret's choice of the site for the well. This is the very place. It's high and dry. It's out of the way of the house. There's good drainage, and there won't be any seepage. Also, added Margaret, it'll be handy for washing up before you come into the house. Travelers can stop here to refresh themselves. Someday, people traveling on further west may come along this road, and we could feed them, maybe even keep them overnight. Margaret, what on earth are you talking about? asked Billy, astounded at Margaret's suggestion. Oh, it might work, said Margaret, in a rather offhanded manner. I'm a good cook. You said so yourself. I could feed people, give them a bed, and they could pay us. And then we could add on to the house, and you could start buying all that land you keep talking about. I don't want you doing that kind of work. Anyway, we'd better stop dreaming and get to work on this well. Billy continued measuring and marking until Hugh Collett and his brother arrived to start their digging. And so the well was completed. It produced clear, cold mountain water, which quenched the thirst of many a traveler as well as the home folk. And in its long history of over 130 years, it has never gone dry. Another pressing task for Margaret before winter set in was making a trip to Paws to get her start of silkworms. As she hurried down the road to accomplish this mission, she pictured the silk dress that she would make for herself. By now, the family had become accustomed to Margaret's living away from home and popping in at frequent intervals. However, they were always happy to see her and greeted her warmly. I've come for the silkworms, she announced as she opened the door. Is Abram around so he can help me dig the mulberry trees? How many will I need? Mary called Abram from the back door. Abram, will you dig some young mulberry trees for Margaret? Get small ones. We'll need about a dozen. She turned to Margaret after she watched Abram walk across the field with his shovel to do her bidding. You stay and visit with me while Abram does the digging. Mary would always miss Margaret's companionship, and she treasured these short visits. Hey, Margaret, Abram's call from the backyard brought an end to this happy interlude, and Mary and Margaret walked out to where he stood with the small trees neatly piled together. I've got some a little bigger than the others and left some dirt around their roots. Hope they'll grow. If not, there are plenty more down there. 
Get the pony and sled, said Mary. This is too big a load for Margaret to try to carry all the way home. You can go along with her and help set them out. Abram went to get the pony and sled. Mary said, Since you're taking the sled, you might as well take along take your flax along. It'll save making another trip. Also, I've been planning to send some of this fresh cut wool over to you so you can get the carding done and get it ready to weave. You shouldn't give me so much. I feel badly about taking all this from you. Why should you? Didn't you help plant the flax and gather it and spread it out before you were married? Then she began enumerating all the steps Margaret would have to go through in the preparing the flax for spinning. Margaret stood before her mother, suppressing the smile that kept trying to appear. Finally, the twinkle in her eyes could not be ignored, and Mary stopped her instructions, and she too burst into laughter. What am I telling you all this for? How many times have you done it right here under my supervision? I guess I'll always think of you as a daughter to instruct instead of a grown-up married woman. They were still sharing the companionship of laughter when John Scott came towards them. Margaret stared unbelievingly at what he was carrying in his arms. I got something for you, he called while he was still a little away from them. Thought you might be needing this little flax wheel. I'm right proud of it. Sort of think it's the prettiest one I've ever made. Sturdy, too. You'll be able to hand this one down to your children and grandchildren. Also made you a spinning wheel. Here are the cards I made. Just finished them last night. That ought to keep you busy for a while, he added with a chuckle. They're beautiful, cried Margaret as she threw her arms around her father's neck. Tears of joy were forming in Margaret's eyes. Now, don't take on so. Wasn't much trouble. I did it at odd minutes when I wasn't busy at the mill. His voice became a little gruff as tender emotion crept over him. Don't forget, I love you too. And then he beat a hasty retreat to the barn before anyone could detect the tears in his eyes. True to all Scotchman's sign and predictions, winter was long, hard, and cold. Billy and Margaret's log cabin had been built by the Cherokees, who had chosen huge logs and laid them well. Before they moved in, Billy repaired the chinking and clay daubing. With five-foot logs burning in the fireplace, the newlyweds were cozy and warm through the snows, which were frequent and deep. When the weather was cold and the moon was right, the young walkers had their first hog killing. This, along with rabbit, squirrel, leather breeches, and dried fruits provided food aplenty for the winter. With the coming of spring, Margaret followed her father's instructions for planting her garden at the proper time. Good Friday found her carefully digging hill after hill and dropping two or three of her precious hoard of bean seeds in each one. Throughout the morning she worked. She was aware the sun was rapidly coming directly over her head, which told her it was time to get to the house and fix Billy dinner. But she did so want to finish this job before going in. She must hurry. As she worked, she was aware of a strange feeling in her stomach and a peculiar lightheadedness that she had never experienced before. Though it was cool, she felt hot. What was wrong? Margaret had never been sick. Surely she was just tired and hungry. Finally, she managed to cover the last seed and head back towards the cabin. Unsteadily, she grasped the gourd from the water bucket at the back door and hastily gulped cool water. Before she knew it, her stomach was heaving, and an instant later, the breakfast she had eaten lay on the doorstep, and welcome blackness engulfed her. She was unaware of the passage of time until she felt cool water splash on her face and a voice calling her name. Then she felt herself being lifted by Billy's strong arms and carried into the house and laid on the big feather bed. Margaret, what happened? He asked anxiously as he lovingly placed a cool damp cloth on her forehead. You've been working too hard. Do you want a drink of water? How about a little peach brandy and water? Here, drink a little of this. Margaret made an effort to rise, but upon feeling her head starting spinning again, she gave up and fell back on the pillow. I don't know what happened. She closed her eyes and rested a few moments. 
Finally, she said, Billy, I just can't get up and fix your dinner. My head spins every time I lift it. You just lie right where you are. Promise not to move? I won't be gone but a minute. Billy dashed out the door, and Margaret gratefully lay back and closed her eyes. She felt that she had hardly closed them when she heard Billy returning with her mother in tow. Here, take this, Mary commanded as she held a spoon in, in close to Margaret's mouth. You just lie there and rest a while while I fix Billy's dinner. You'll feel better shortly. Mary's confident words boistered Margaret's waning spirits, and she willingly submitted to her mother's ministrations. Dinner over, Mary returned to Margaret's bedside. Feeling any better, she asked. I'm afraid I don't, was the rather mournful reply. Wonder what on earth's the matter with me. I know she's been working too hard. I, I beg her not to, but she won't listen. Billy was still shaken over having come in from the store and finding Margaret lying on the step in a dead faint. Mrs. Scott smiled knowingly, shook her head in a wise fashion as she said, of course, I can't be sure, but I would guess she might be in a family way. It seemed to take a few seconds for Mary's announcement to sink in on the young people, but as Mary watched the smile sped, spread across Billy's face as he knelt beside Margaret, she knew she was no longer needed. She quietly left the room, leaving them to their shining dreams. Margaret felt a closeness with nature this spring as she watched the miracle of rebirth, for she too was experiencing the same miracle of new life. Under the watchful eye of Mrs. Scott, Margaret happily skipped through that beautiful spring in a haze of azure and gold. All nature was putting forth its glowing splendor, especially for her. The greens were so much greener and the blues bluer. Each new bud was a reminder to Margaret of the growing, living being inside her that would, in a few short months, be her child, hers and Billy's child. Margaret's joy was unlimited. She would rush through her chores so that she could have the time to make things more beautiful in the world for her child to come into. She spent many hours working in her rose garden. She hoed and planted and watered and watched them grow those little rose cuttings she had so carefully rooted from the ones Mary Scott had brought with her from Pennsylvania, first to Wilkes County, then on to Cherokee County. While she worked and planned, Billy worked and fretted. He didn't want Margaret to overtax her strength, yet there was no controlling her. Margaret even caught herself feeling a little sorry for Billy. How could he, a mere man, know the feeling of joy she felt within herself as she felt their child move and knew the ecstasy of having been chosen to help replenish the earth. Because of this, she felt an extra tenderness towards him, and she held him to her and tried to impart some of her newfound happiness for him to share. Their love was special, and they were living in a special world all their own. The Scott children were almost as happy over the expected arrival of Margaret's little one as were the future grandparents. Where there had been many visits between Margaret and her family, these were increased now that she needed her mother's help and advice. Mary helped with the making of little garments. She insisted that Margaret drink tea made from sassafras root to build up her blood. She warned her not to reach over her head as this was considered dangerous for the unborn child. Also, she mustn't look at lizards or snakes or anything red where she could mark the child. She must be very careful not to cause the baby to be born with a birthmark. Both expectant mother and grandmother spent many extra hours at the loom weaving soft cloth, which they fashioned into blankets, tiny dresses, and shirts to keep the baby warm. One day, Margaret asked her mother, Where's Pa? I never see him when I come over lately. Mary smiled conspiratorially as she confided, He's making the baby a cradle. He's making it out of cherry wood. He said Billy didn't have time, and besides, he's the best carpenter in the area. How wonderful. Paul's so sweet. He really does make the prettiest wood furniture around these parts. How happy Billy will be to hear this. Don't you dare tell Billy. 
Paul wants this to be a surprise. He says it's almost finished. The very next day, Paul appeared at Margaret's door carrying the beautiful little cherry wood cradle which he had so lovingly made for his first grandchild. He placed it in the darkest corner of the little back room and warned, don't let anyone see this. That'll be bad luck. Margaret smiled a little to herself, but to her father, she said, I certainly don't want any bad luck. What's in the other bundle? Oh, that's something your ma sent over. It's a little feather bed for this cradle. She wants it to be nice and soft for the little feller. Then he added as he started to leave, Now don't you go worrying yourself about bad luck. Everything's going to work out fine. With the coming of spring and the cold winter behind them, the valley people stirred into activity. Colonel Wogg sent Billy an assistant named William Hubbard. Hubbard slept in the trading post and helped Billy in all his responsibilities. The colonel had other enterprises in the valley besides his trading post. These included a sawmill and a whiskey still. Billy was in charge of all three. Upon his most recent visit to Wilkes County, his parents had raised an objection to Billy's running the whiskey still, even for someone else. Billy returned home on a fine new pony, a present from his parents. Mr. and Mrs. Walker had also sent along with him many household items for Margaret, along with the promise of some slaves as soon as Billy had a place to house them and land enough to require them. One morning, as Billy was preparing to ride up the creek to check on the still, he said to Margaret, My pa sure talked against this whiskey business when I was home last. He and Ma wanted me to tell the colonel I wouldn't run it for him. I don't like the idea of running it, but as long as I work for Wog, I guess he has the right to tell me what to do. I agree with your folks, said Margaret. Maybe you ought to study some way to get out of that kind of business. Colonel Wog gave me a going over when I was up there. He said he wanted me to see that we didn't lose a drop of that whiskey. Went through all the instructions of how I should make it and inspect the barrels and put the stoppers in good and tight so none would evaporate. You'd think I hadn't been doing his work all these years. He's so tight, he don't want a thing going to waste. He wants me to feed the whiskey mash to the hogs. Seems he has over a hundred now. He's so close and tight. We don't waste things, but we aren't misers either. I know we have to be saving, but there's no reason for going to the extreme. David Hennessy came in from Wilkes today. He says Wog wants him to bring back some hides. I have more than a wagon load. The Indians have been bringing them in their winter kill, and there are a lot of them, mostly deer and bear hides, but I do have some mink and possum. With David making the trip back to Wilkes and Hubbard to help you in the store, surely you won't have to make so many trips now. I hate to have you gone. I don't like to be alone. I don't like it either, but I've got to make a trip to Savannah soon. I told the colonel last time I saw him that this would be my last trip for a while on account of your condition. He says we have to get in stock for Christmas. He's talking about trading hides down there for calico and even some fancy things. Spring ripened into summer. Summer, a good time in the mountains. Warm days and cool nights. Plenty of work, yet time for play. The first tinge of autumn was in the air that chilly September morning when Billy was making final preparations to leave for Savannah. The trip had been put off since last spring's visit to the old colonel. Margaret usually stayed away from the store, which was considered a man's domain. Besides, no woman would expose herself to the public when in a family way. However, today was special. Billy was leaving. Margaret walked with Billy across the road towards the store. In the semi-darkness ahead, they could see the wagons and David Hennessy and William Hubbard loading the last supplies as they were making ready for the long trip to the coast. Billy started taking mental inventory. The count ends up at about 40 hides. That ought to please Wog. He was busily bustling around checking the lines on the wagon and seeing that all was in readiness. Hennessy, Wog wants you to come right back with that load of whiskey and the next load you are to bring the hogs. 
I fed them mash like you told me, and there's plenty of mash this year. They ought to be in good shape. Turning to Hubbard, Billy started giving him final instructions for his care of the store during his absence. I hope I won't be gone longer than 10 days, so take care of things. If Mrs. Walker needs anything, see that she gets it. Then he turned to Margaret, standing a little apart and looking forlorn in the early morning light. He walked over and took her in his arms, much to the surprise of the two men standing by the wagon. Billy was not one to show emotion in front of others. Don't stay by yourself. If your brother can't come to our house, you go to your mother's. He smiled. I'll bring you some pretty calico and the biggest seashell I can find on the coast. I'll be all right, said Margaret. Here, take this basket of food I packed for you. She handed him the large Indian basket she had packed for his trip. Billy accepted it as he climbed onto the wagon, gathered the reins, and clucked to the mules. The wagon creaked and lurched forward. He turned to wave as the wagon lumbered noisily into the fog and from Margaret's view. Margaret watched him out of sight, then returned to the house, and there in the privacy of her own little room, for one of the few times in her life, she gave herself up to the luxury of tears. She was lonely and tired and not a little overcome with self-pity. After a while, the tears had run their course and served their purpose of washing her inner world clean like a spring shower. She got up, went back to the porch, washed her face in cool water, and was once again ready to wash the dishes, clean the kitchen, scrub the floors, all the while humming snatches of Sourwood Mountain. The moon was a powerful influence on the life of the people of the valley. Everything was done according to its dictates. Crops were planted at the full of the moon, or the dark of the moon, or the new of the moon. Luck was controlled by the moon. One should never sleep in the light of the full moon, and of course, New life was subject to the phases of the moon. Babies were born at the full of the moon. At the full of the moon in November, Mary Scott made her way up the road to be with Margaret. When she reached the little two-room cabin, she met Mary Collett. I thought I'd stay with Margaret tonight, the moon's being full and her about ready to have her first one. I had the same thought, replied Mrs. Collett. Brought my knitting along. I told Elizabeth for her and the blacks to look out for breakfast for Abe and the boys. I brought my handwork, too. I guess John and the girls can manage things for one night. I know Margaret needs me more than they do. As they entered the house, Margaret greeted them with joy. Mother, Mrs. Collett, I'm glad to see you. I can't seem to keep from getting a little nervous when I'm alone. Can one of you stay all night? Suppose the baby comes tonight. Both women smiled in assent. Mary held up her knitting and pointed to Mrs. Collett's. See, we brought our knitting, so we'll stay busy until you need us. I guess with the moon full and all three of us thinking that tonight is the night, it'll just have to be tonight. One thing the mountain women believed was that a woman in labor must keep moving. Mary Scott and Mary Collett took turns with Margaret ceaselessly walking up and down and around the little room. They kept the fire going and the water boiling. Late in the evening, when Billy came in from the store, he called, Margaret, the moon is full tonight. It's time for that baby to get here. You know I've ordered a boy. Then he realized that Margaret was not alone. Mrs. Scott, is everything all right? Both the women in attendance assured him that all was well. Mrs. Scott added, you have to be patient about these things. It might be a while yet, but we're glad you're here. Hadn't I better go get Dr. Patton? Of course not, Billy. It's a long trip to Murphy, and you probably wouldn't get back in time. Besides, we've done this before. Mrs. Scott teasingly added, You know, Billy, this isn't the first baby to come into this world. Billy was reassured for a time, but as the long night dragged on and Margaret continued to walk the floor, Billy again turned anxiously to his mother-in-law. Why is this taking so long? Shouldn't the baby be here by now? No, it's really not taking so long. It just seems that way. Because we're waiting. It's natural for the first one to be slow. It probably won't be long now. 
I uh, still think I ought to go get Doc Patton. There is nothing wrong. I told you, it takes longer for the first one. Everything's fine. Billy bowed to her superior knowledge and walked over to stare into the fireplace. He was strong, but he was worried. He stole a glance over to the bed where Margaret now lay still and quiet. Suppose something happened to Margaret. Suppose she should die. Tears ran down his cheeks and splashed unnoticed on the warm hearth below. As the faint light of dawn was opening up the world for a new day, the sound of lusty cries announced the arrival of a new life along with the day. Billy turned as Mary Scott walked across the room with a squirming infant in her arms. My first grandchild, she breathed reverently as she held the baby for Billy to see. Didn't I tell you that full moons brought boys, boomed Miss Collett's voice as she continued her announcement. He's as fit as a fiddle. What are you going to name him, Billy? Billy knelt beside Margaret's bed. We've got a son, he whispered, as both parents looked at the wee red-faced infant. The little one raised one arm, stretched, opened his mouth, and yawned. They laughed merrily as they watched him. Guess you're about as sleepy as the rest of us, aren't you, son? You ought to be. You kept us up all night. What'll we name him, Margaret? I was thinking last night that it might be nice to name our first son after both his grandpas. How does Charles Agnew sound? Sounds good to me, answered Billy. So the decision was made that their first son was to bear the name Charles Agnew after his paternal grandfather, Charles Walker, and his maternal grandfather, John Agnew Scott, and that he would henceforth be called Agnew. With that, William and Margaret Walker started the list of names in their family Bible. Charles Agnew Walker, born November 1, 1845. As Margaret's family was growing, so was the little valley in which they had settled. Margaret stopped by her mother's one day and said to her sister Maria, Let's go across the river to visit the new family over there. Mary Collett's brother and his wife have moved into an Indian cabin over across the Conaheat River. Billy heard it at the trading post yesterday, and I thought it would pay that we'd pay them a call. I'd like to go, responded Maria. I'll help you carry Agnew. My, he's getting big. Mother, don't you want to go with us? Do come, Mother, seconded Margaret. I understand that they are Scotch also. They come from the Caldwell section of the Yadkin Valley, and Mrs. Stewart was named Scott too, but Mrs. Collett says that we're not kin. She moved up here and lived with her brothers out in Hanging Dog and taught the first school in this county. The visit was a success. The women became good friends. Mrs. Stewart showed them around her new place. They met James Stewart, who was busily starting a tannery for the valley. The Stewarts had brought some blacks with them, along with whom were a weaver, a carpenter, a cook, and a blacksmith. In addition to the tannery, they were constructing a blacksmith shop. Mary Scott graciously welcomed the new family to the community. We are very happy to have new families here. We need good neighbors and new businesses. She walked around the new construction and expressed an interest in the process of tanning leather. This, of course, pleased Mr. Stewart, who immediately launched into a detailed description of how it was done, including the fact that he had waited for the new moon in June before taking the bark from the trees to make the tannic acid for the hides. Mrs. Scott went home that day knowing more about the tanning of leather than she really felt the need of, but she had made a friend. Before she left, she commented to Mrs. Stewart, I hear you are adept in the use of medicinal herbs and teas and native remedies. We need someone with your kind of knowledge close by. My John's been complaining about his stomach a lot lately. He's been losing weight. You think you might have something to recommend for him? Mrs. Stewart assured them that she would drop by and check on Mr. Scott soon, and the three visitors left for home. It was a pleasant walk, though at times little Agnew got pretty heavy, but with a doting grandmother, a young aunt, and a help, healthy mother to take turns carrying him, this proved to be no problem, and the journey seemed short as they were 
as they had much to talk about the talk about concerning their pleasure at getting to know their new neighbors.